I'm a former professional rugby league player. I played rugby league for just over uh, 10 years. Um, unfortunately, toward the back end of my career, uh, I suffered quite a nasty knock. Hence why this is now my mode of transport. Now, people talk about a lucky break in life. I don't know how you guys define a lucky break. My lucky break came in October 2002 uh, when I broke my neck in two places playing that game that I love. It was a shock to say the least and it certainly didn't feel like a lucky thing back then. Um, but I'm hoping by the end of this presentation uh, you'll see where I'm coming from in that um, you know, life has a funny way of turning around, things around and it really was uh, a lucky break for me. I now go around all of the country and I'm very, very privileged and, 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 and honoured actually to go around the country speaking uh, about adversity, mental fitness, how if we look after ourselves, you know, we can kind of uh, go through any sort of adversity and, and turn things around. I guess as a youngster, uh, when I first uh, got on the scene of playing rugby league, I had no ambition of becoming a rugby league player. Um, in fact, I wasn't that good at it, to be brutally honest. Um, I didn't have a lot of natural flair and skill, um, but I always kind of gave 100% and I believe that that's how uh, I've lived my life since uh, my injury. I was in the building industry and I played rugby league. So I was very much a kind of physical alpha male. Um, and towards the back end of 2002, um, when, I injury, uh, when I sustained my injury, um, I, I didn't know how, how I was going to turn things around. I didn't know how this, this thing was going to go. As an alpha male in the building industry, um, we were always taking the mickey, having a laugh, and it was the same in rugby league. And that, that similar sort of banter was something that I, I lived by. And then, like I said, towards the back end of 2002, I played a game of rugby league that changed my life forever. I took a ball into a tackle, uh, nothing malicious, nothing untoward, but as soon as I hit the defensive line, I heard this crack and this harrowing noise, a noise that I didn't recognise. Um, from the tackle being made and me going to ground, I was paralysed my neck down. I actually snapped my neck in two places, my C3-4, which is high lesion in the back of the neck. And when I went down on the ground, I was then paralysed my neck down, and deemed quadriplegic, which is what I am now, yeah, even still today. Now we're supposed to be these big tough match of rugby league players that show no emotions. I can tell you now I was terrified. I didn't know uh, what I was feeling, what I wasn't feeling. I couldn't actually feel anything physically. I remember saying to a teammate, am I laid on my arms? And he said, no mate, they're outside of you. I looked down, I could see my arms, I could see my legs, but I couldn't feel anything. Um, I was scared, to say the least. Uh, I was taken to uh, Leeds General, uh, which is near where I live. And they operated on me there, they cut me front and back, went in and put a metal plate over my vertebrae to stabilise me. When I came round from that operation, um, not only was I paralysed my neck down, but I could no longer breathe for myself. Uh, I was on a ventilator. They took me and my dad into a room and basically said that your lad's paralysed from his neck down, but he's now possibly going to be on a ventilator for the rest of his life. I cannot even imagine what that must have felt like for my mum and dad. Uh, I'm a parent now myself, and uh, those, those words would just cut through me. The surgeon that operated on me uh, followed me through to, uh, I got transferred to Wakefield to the spinal unit. And uh, the surgeon that had actually operated on me came through with me and he's up and lying to me as I laid on that bed, was I'm really sorry son, but your life's never going to be the same again. You're never going to sit up, you're never going to walk, you're never going to feed yourself and look after yourself, you're never going to have children. All the things we kind of take for granted, I am never going to have again. Now I'm 28 years of age and this is not how I saw my life panning out. I decided that given the prognosis, that, that lovely prognosis that the doctor had given me, that that night was the last night I was going to go to sleep. My brother came to see me the following morning, and as he leaned over the bed to say good morning, I cut him off quite sharp, and I said, mate, you're going to have to do something for me that I physically can't do for myself, and that's to put a pillow over my face and to kill me to take my life. So I didn't want to be here. I didn't want people dressing me, feeding me, pushing me around and looking after me. That's not how I saw my life. Now, my brother's a strong kid. He's my rock. He's my best friend today. And uh, he said, Jimmy, please don't talk that way. Don't even think that way. However, he did say that if in 18 months' time I still felt the same way, he'd be looking at it for me, which thought really good of him. <laughs> the little bugger. Um, but, you know, uh, that was a point really where I guess my life took a, a, a big turn, uh, quite, a, quite a severe turn. I'm kind of one of those that I believe that in life sometimes it comes down to two things. You've got two options in life. You can either get up or you can give up. It's as simple as that. I can sugarcoat it all you want, and I can give you lots and lots of different advice and angles of where to go at things, and believe you me, I've tried every one of them. But sometimes we have to have a little bit of responsibility and a little bit of accountability for how our actions are, are derived and where we go with things. I decided from that point onwards that if I was going to be here, I was going to control my life rather than it controlling me. And the first thing I want to do was going to set some achievable goals. Now, something I stress when I go into lots of different areas of speaking now is that a goal is only any good if it's achievable. Do not give yourself a goal that you cannot reach, that you cannot obtain. 
because I fall back down from where you begin is a hell of a lot further than where you begin with. And I always say that the difference between a goal and a vision is two very, very different things. A vision is something we should aspire to. A vision is something that's quite a distance away. That's not a goal. A goal is what a tool that we use in order to reach that vision. And by using the achievable goals, I guess I guarantee you now, if you set five to ten small achievable goals, you'll reach them, you'll obtain them, and you'll give yourself a little pat on the back, and you'll be halfway towards your vision. My first goal, uh, believe it or not, was to have a nice, clean shave. I've been in hospital now a couple of weeks, and the nurses that looked after me, they were absolutely legends. They were, honestly, they were angels without wings, but they could not shave a man. <laughs> so we got a nice razor, we strapped it to the back of my hand, and my brother helped me, and my dad helped me over, and we took it on my face, and it felt fantastic. It felt like I'd done something for myself, albeit with a little bit of help. But something I stress in life is if you ask for help in the right manner, you get it in spades. My two further goals after this was to pick my own nose and wipe my own backside. Um, I'm happy to share this evening. I've achieved both those goals, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't always plain sailing. I was in hospital for nine months, and it's a, it's a long time. Um, but when I, when, I, and when I were in there, I, I was safe. You know, if I fell out of my chair, which I did on a regular basis, people picked me back up and put me back in my chair. If I had questions that needed answering, there were people there to answer them. When I got home after nine months uh, of all-inclusive um, in, in, in the hospital, I soon realised that that block came again. I couldn't just go and jump in my car and meet my friends. I couldn't just go down to the gym. I couldn't go training. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't do the things that I'd, I'd normally done. And that block came again, and I kind of had to find something that maybe I didn't even actually realise existed, and that was my mental fitness. You know, physically-wise, I'd always been taught to be mental, physically strong, fast and powerful, but nobody ever taught me to be mentally strong. And I now go around with a charity called State of Mind where we, t where we basically give out presentations for uh, mental fitness and, and well-being. I, I kind of thought, right, how do I, how do I what do I do? I, I, who do I need around me? And I needed some good people around me. And like I said, when I said about the, the lucky break in the beginning, I have been very, very lucky and fortunate to have some amazing, fantastic people around me. Not just my family and my friends, but close people as well and people that have come into my life. Uh, one particular guy, in particular there's a guy in the middle of the pitch there holding the ball with me, a guy called Steve Prescott. Prekey was... An incredible rugby league player uh, for St. Helens, but also the most honest, straight, selfless man I've ever met. What a gent, honestly, what an absolute diamond of a guy. Steve was diagnosed with terminal cancer in 2006 and was given six months to live. Now he could have gone home and washed, his, washed that time away very quickly, but he didn't. He decided to raise money for injured players, people like myself, and raise awareness for Christie's Cancer Research in Manchester. Steve had lots and lots of grand visions and ideas of uh, doing uh, bizarre challenges for, for money, for charity. And I guess because I'm not wired up right myself, I kind of joined in on, on many of those challenges. Uh, we started off with small walks from Hull to Old Trafford to deliver ball for the grand final at Manchester. I did it in a wheelchair with people pushing me. We came up through France on uh, bikes. I had an adapted quad bike and, a, and a, an hand bike that attaches to the front of my chair. We crossed the channel up the River Thames with the likes of Johnny Vegas in a dragon boat with us, which was dead funny at the time. <laughs> and we delivered the ball into the Challenge Cup final at, at Wembley. Uh, I've become just a second person to unsight off from one end of the country to the other and land record time 11 and a half, time, uh, 11 and a half uh, days. All the things that we do now, uh, in fa fairness, is not about trophies and for medals. It's to prove to people that even when you think you are flat on your bum or you've got no alternatives, there are always alternatives. There are always options. And how bleak and how bad you think a situation is, there is always a way of turning it around. You know, many, many people have said to me so many times along the years, um, what happens when a door closes and when, when something goes wrong? And it does, because that's life. Life's not linear. Life's very much up and down. It's like a roller coaster. Me personally, I believe if a door closes on you, it allows you an opportunity to go and open another one. And if you can't open another one, you go kick the thing down until you get where you want to get. Do not allow people to stop you from doing what you want to do. These are some of the, uh, some of the challenges we've done, but um, I can assure you now, um, without the right people around me, I'll probably never have got to do some of those challenges. Where do I go now? I guess now I suppose the fact that I now speak for the living and I go kind of all around the country giving these uh, presentations. For me, I believe now it gives me a purpose as to why uh, this injury happened. Uh, again, we're talking this evening about you know, life finds its way around things. But certainly for me, if I go out and I can help other people, there's no better feeling in the world. And for me, if I can help other people, that means that what happened to me actually makes sense as to why it happened. That's quite a bizarre way of looking at it, because I certainly wouldn't have looked at it from the first place. Um, but I believe that that's how we, you've got to look at life. You've got to be quite optimistic and look at things in a positive way and find the best in, way of, in things. I'm just going to give you a quick story before I finish. Um, I don't know what you guys fear or what you guys don't want to do or, or, or you're, you're not against things. I personally don't fear very much, although there's one or two things that uh, are quite scary to me. My wife's one of them, and she's sat in front of me right now. 
Uh, and also, uh, I'm not over keen on, on flying. Um, so I got asked to do a parachute jump with the uh, British um, regiment uh, in the Red Devils, which is an honour in itself. And I kind of thought, well, I don't really want to jump out of a perfectly good aeroplane. Uh, so I kind of thought to myself, surely, in technicality reasons, they won't let me jump out of an aircraft in, in the situation that I'm in. That's what I kind of thought. Uh, and that didn't really go to plan. I uh, went down to Norfolk to where we were doing the jump. And uh, we got him put in a small room like this. And uh, a guy came to the doorway, a guy called Sergeant Billy Blanchard from Four Power. And he stood in that doorway and he said, right, guys, I want you all on your backs. Raise your knees to your chest, roll to your left, roll to your right. As long as you can do that, you can jump out of an aircraft. And I'm thinking, get in. <laughs> on technicalities, <laughs> I won't have to do this jump. I can get out of this. And he's looking at me and he's smiling. And he said, Jimmy, the boys have preempted me to say that you aren't that keen on doing this jump. He says, so I brought along these nailed up a pair of pants, black and uh, red pants. You can see me wearing them there at the front of the plane. And basically the idea was that these pants had two straps in them. So those two straps, when we jump out of the aircraft and we open the chute, I would pass these straps to Sergeant Billy. He'd have two ratchets here. He'd ratchet up and ratchet my legs up so that when we land, my legs were raised so we'd land safely. That was the plan. Then he went on to tell me that as of yet, these pants have never actually been worn or tested. <laughs> okay, so let's go. So we get into the aircraft, and as you can see, it wasn't a very big aircraft. And there were 10 of us packed in. And I remember Sergeant Billy leaning forward to me and saying, uh, Jimmy, are you ready to go? And I remember saying to him, well, if I'm not, do I get a choice? He said, not really, because you're the last one in. So if you don't want to go, we'll have to throw you out anyway. So we sat on edge of the craft there. And that's that picture there. And Sergeant Billy leaned forward to me and said, Jimmy, I'm going to count to three, and then we're going to go. Now, I know that that little bugger only counted to two, and we'd gone. <laughs> so at this point now, any process and outcome that you want to look at is irrelevant, because there's only one thing you're going in, and that's down. And as, we, as we're coming down, all I can say is it was the well, it was 175 mile an hour, 18 second drop. Uh, and the rush, and, and, and it was just phenomenal. And I have to say, I mean, I know my wife's here, but it was the best 18 seconds of my life. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and the shoot opens, you know, it goes dead quiet and, and tranquil and peaceful. And all of a sudden, we're floating around, and Sergeant Billy says, right, Jimmy, pass me your first strap. So my right strap, I got it out of my pouch, pass it to him, put it ratchet in, ratchet it up, and it snapped. So my right leg fired down, I'm thinking, not a good start. This one, he says, all right, son, we'll use the other one. So my left arm and my left hand is not as functional as my right, and I couldn't even get that strap out of that pouch. So at this point now, there's no straps in sight. My legs are firing down, and we're coming down towards the ground. I could see the big Z on the ground, which I assume was the landing site, and I just said to Sergeant Billy, we're not going to met that way. He said, no. I said, where are we going to land then? He said, I don't know yet. And you, when you go, <laughs> this man don't know where we're going to land, I don't know where we're going to land. So we're coming down. He said, it's all right, it's September. The co there's a big cornfield below, and the corn's fully grown. So when the corn's fully grown, it's like a big cushion. I thought, great. So we're swirling around. As we came towards the corn, he just then tapped me and says, uh, by the way, the corn it is fully grown. The leaves around the corn itself will act like razor blades because they protect the corn. So when we go into the field, we're going to get cut from head to toe. I thought, fantastic. Why not? <laughs> so as we got towards the cornfield, as we got to the edge, he pulled the left toggle and he spun us both right the way around. And we went into that cornfield, he took the full blunt and he was cut from head to toe. That's when he got a razor blade all the way up him, all up his suit, all up his face. And it had a mark on me. Now, I have utmost respect for these guys anyway, but on that day, my respect for this guy just went through the roof. But the reason why I tell that story, guys, is because sometimes in life, you have to put your trust into people that know a little bit more about what they're doing than what you do. And if you can do that, the events that you will do and take part in can turn out to be some of the best events you will ever do in your life. That was without doubt, without a shadow, one of the best days of my life. And I wouldn't have done that if I wouldn't have trusted in somebody, if there wouldn't have been somebody around me with, with, with great advice and support and information. So guys, I wish you well in all you do. I just want to close by saying one thing. Uh, the surgeon that told me that I wouldn't be able to sit up and feed myself, <laughs> this don't feed itself. I was told I'd never be able to walk, and when I got married to my wife here, I walked her down the aisle. And I told her, I told her I'd never have children. I've got a beautiful little girl who's just rang us now to say she's got a start at week, and I've got a stunning little boy. And they're both naturally conceived too, so I'm dead chuffed about that. <laughs> Guys, I wish you well in everything you do. Please enjoy your evening, because it's a fantastic evening. I know the girls have put a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, so thank you very much. But another thing as well, do everything you can to the best of your ability. And allow life to take its pattern, let, let, let take its time. Be patient, be, 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 po be positive in where you go, and, and never, ever doubt yourself. Always back yourself. Last slide, no limits. Do not see any limits. Don't allow anybody to stop you from doing what you do. <laughs> Yes, this might be a little bit of a, a bit of a giggle, but believe you me, the only person that you want to do in your life is yourself. So don't allow anybody to stop you from doing it. And most importantly, do everything you can with a smile on your face and the door right. Thank you very much, guys.